Chains, Chapter 9 I was stuck on the back step with a pile of dull knives and a wet stone. It was a dreary job. First, spit on the stone. Next, hold a knife at the proper angle and circle it against the stone, ten to the left, ten to the right, until the blade was sharp enough to slice through a joint of beef like it was warm butter. As I sharpened, I imagined using the knife to cut through the ropes that tied us to New York. I'd slide through the ocean, and Ruth and me, we'd walk the sand all the way home, ten circles to the left. Ruth was above stairs, standing by Wilt's madam prepared herself for company. The master was locked in his library. Becky was somewhere in the crowd watching General Washington parade down Broadway with five regiments of soldiers, the sounds of beating drums and whistling rifles, and the cries of Huzza! Huzza! blew towards me over the rooftops. I pushed everything out of my mind, save my task, ten circles to the right. Becky came back from the parade an hour later, overflowing with stories. She nattered on about the spectacle whilst the assembly, the sp- uh, the tea things for Madam and Lady Seymour, who had come again to call. I pretended to listen. Truth be told, I didn't notice when she left carrying the tray. Ten circles to the left, ten circles to the righty. All make the blade sharp and mighty. Ten circles to the left, ten circles to the right. Becky called for me twice before I heard her proper. Her voice was high and tight. I said to hurry. You want to get me put out on the street? Madam wants you in the parlor. The knife nearly or near slipped from my hands. Is it Ruth? No. Lady Seymour wants to see you. And the master just arrived with gentlemen friends, all calling for food and drink. Hurry. I washed in the co- or I washed up in the cold water bucket, quietly pinned on a clean apron, checked my kerchief was on the proper and then followed becky to the parlor she rapped lightly on the door and pushed it open the new girl ma'am she said setting a plate of fresh baked strawberry tarts on the table show her in madam said becky waved at me or waved at me to enter madam and an older woman sat at the table but my eyes were drawn behind them to my sister dressed up as madam's pretty pet in bleached linen shift a navy blue brocade or uh, brocade short gown and a full skirt patterned with lilacs when she saw me she clenched her hands together a bit uh, and bit her lower lip her eyes were red and swollen with crying my belly went funny and my mind raced why had she been crying was she sick scared did madam hurt her Becky poked me gently in the back. This was not any time for questions. I quickly dropped into a curtsy, bowing my head. When I stood up, the older woman and the lady aunt with the money gave me a shadow of a smile. She was smaller than Madame and wore a silk gown, the color of a mourning dove, and gray lacy gloves. Her hair was curled high and powdered snow white. A necklace set with black stones shone from her neck. There was deep lines in the corners of her eyes and around her mouth, but I couldn't tell if they were from laughing or from crying. She turned in her hair or in her chair and looked at, at Ruth, then back at me. "'Are these two girls sisters?' she asked. Madame reached for the tart. "'That's what the man said.' The old woman sipped her tea. "'What is your name, girl?' she asked me. "'Isabel, ma'am. I am Isabel, Isabel Finch.' "'Ridiculous name,' Madame said. She opened her fan and waved it in front of her face. "'You are called Sal Lockton now. It's more suitable.' I forced myself to breathe in slow and regular instead of telling her that my name was not her affair. Yes, ma'am. I, or she glanced at my feet. And you must wear shoes. This is a house, not a barn. Ruth stepped out of the corner. Isabel. Madam snapped the fan shut and, and wrapped it against the edge of the table, startling us all. What did I tell you about silence? She said roughly. Ruth raised one shaking finger towards her mouth and said, Shh. Precisely, Madame set the fan in her lap and reached for a piece of sugar with the silver tongs. When she plopped it in the cup, the tea overflowed into the saucer. Or into the saucer, Ruth stood there like a carved statue, her fingers still to her lips. She took another breath, slower than the first, and tried not to think on the newly sharpened knives on the kitchen steps. Lady Seymour curled her fingers around the teacup, her gaze marking or er, marking first Madame, then Ruth, and then me. She said nothing. "'Would you like Sal to serve you and Lady Seymour while I wait on the gentleman?' Becky asked. 
absolutely not. Show her to the library and make sure the men are fed and bring fresh tea. This is gone, or this is already gone cold. We curtsied and left the parlor. Ruth's sad eyes followed me to the door. Ten circles to the left, ten circles to the righty. Make the blade sharp and mighty. Back in the kitchen, Becky took a large silver tray off a high shelf in the pantry. Hold this. She loaded the tray with a plate of cold sliced tongue, cheddar cheese, brown bread, and a bowl of pickles. I could not stop thinking about the way Ruth had jumped when Madame shouted, nor the tears in her eyes. Becky looked down at the second tray and set it upon the four goblets, two bottles of claret wine, and a crock of mustard. She swung the kettle back over the fire to heat up more water, picked up the tray with wine, and said, Hop to. I followed her to the front of the house. But what about my shoes? The master won't notice as long as he gets his grub, Becky said. Or Becky uh, balanced the edge of the tray on her hip and knocked on the door on the right side of the front hall. When a deep voice answered, she opened it, locked and looked up as we entered. Oh, good, sustenance, he said, pushed aside the stack of newspapers to clear off the desk. The room was the same size and shape as a parlor, but the two of the walls had bookcases built into them. A large painting of horses jumping high over a hedge hung on the third wall. A thin layer of dust lay over everything. The front windows were open, bringing in fresh air and noise from the streets, carts rolling over the cobblestones, and church bells in the distance mingling with the voices of four men who sat around the enormous desk. One man looked poorer than the others. The cuffs on his coat were frayed, and his hands were stained with ink. Next to him sat a man with a suspicious gray eyes and a, a liver-colored coat with a double row of gold buttons fastened over a large um, pudding belly. The third man wore something on his head that looked more like a dead possum than a wig, but his coat was was crisp and, the new, and new, and the buckles on his shoes gleamed. The fourth was Master Lockton, looking uh, like a cat who had just swallowed the last bite of juicy of a juicy mouse. Becky sat her tray on the sideboard. I held mine as she poured the wine and served the gentleman. Then she had me hold the food tray so that she could serve the tongue in the cheese. Talk halted or halted as the men started into their meal. Becky, Madame called from across the hall. "'Go see to her,' locked and told Becky. "'The girl can stay here. "'Does she know where the wine is?' "'Yes, sir,' I said. "'Becky and Lockton both stared at me. "'I had spoken out of turn. "'My job was to be silent and to follow orders. "'Ruth had already learned that. "'Shh!' "'Wine kept flowing and plates full. "'Locked and said, "'My friends eat more at my table than their own.' As Becky left, Gold Buttons drained his wine, then raised his goblet. I hurried over to pour him another and topped off the drinks of the other men. Lockton gave me a curt nod when I was finished. Stand over there, he said, pointing to the corner of the two bookshelves uh, where they met each other. I gave a wordless curtsy and took my place. The men dove back into their conversation. Who has been arrested because of the oath, demanded Lockton. "'Fools, unschooled in the art of fence-sitting,' said Gold Buttons. "'Plank-walking, you mean,' said Inkstained. Shabbywig leaned forward and pointed his finger at Inkstained. "'Don't you turn the coward on us, when not when we're this close.' "'Close,' argued er, Inkstained. "'Do you see his majesty in the ships, in sh uh, the majesty's ships in the harbor?' I don't. I might argue that England has fled and the rebel traitors have won. Lower your voices, Lockton said with a scowl. He closed the windows with a loud bang and returned to his seat. His Majesty's ships are very close, closer than you know. This rebellion will be smashed like glass under a heavy boot. The king will be very grateful for our assistance. The mention of the king caught my ear. I studied the wide boards on the floor and listened with care. Gold Buttons popped a piece of cheese into his mouth and talked as he chewed. I sincerely hope you speak the truth, Elihu. The rebel committees are multiplying faster than rabbits in the spring. They've just about ground or they've just about ground business to halt. Have they interfered with you directly? Lockton asked. Every waking minute. Uh, gold button said the latest bit of nonsense is a committee to detect conspiracies they've sent out hounds after us old friend 
Have you written to Parliament? They need the specifics of our difficulties. Parliament is as far away as the moon, complained Inkstain, as the other men argued about the Parliament in letters of protest and counter-letters and counter-counter-letters. Shabby Wiggs stabbed the last piece of tongue on his plate and shoved them into his mouth. Then, er, he turned and set he turned in his seat to look at me and held out his plate and grunted if i had ever done such a thing mamma would have uh, switched my behind for having the manners of a pig even miss mary finch had asked with a please and a thank you when mamma had served her dinner this is new york i reminded myself as i crossed the room and took the plate out of his hands the rules are different now i loaded his plate with the last slices of tongue and set it in front of him before retreating to my corner everything is different my belly growled and grumbled in, in, in its cage. The smell of the tongue and the mustard and the cheese filled the room and made my mouth water. I had eaten a bowl of corn mush at sunrise and only dumplings at midday. To distract the beast from my, gut, or from my gullet, I tried to read the names of the books on the shelves without turning my head. My eyes were starved for the words as the rest of me was for dinner. It was hard to read from the side from the side like that. I wanted to pull the book down, open it proper, and gobble up a page after page. I wanted to stare into the faces of those of these men and demand that they take me home. I wanted to jump on the horse in the painting and fly over the hills. Most of all, I wanted to grab my sister by the hand and run as fast as we could until the cobblestone disappeared and there was dirt under our feet again. Girl, Lockton said, bring us more bread, sliced thin, and some of Becky's apricot jam. I've missed the taste of that. I curtsied and hurried out of the room, leaving the door open a crack so I could easily open it when I came back with my hands full. Across the hall came a quiet conversation of Madame and Lady Seymour. I paused but heard no mention of Ruth. Shh. There was fresh bread on the kitchen table, but it took a piece of time to find the crock of jam. I used one of my sharp knives to slice the loaf and set, set the slices on a clean plate and put the plate of jam on the tray. It was taking me too long to finish a simple chore. I feared the master would be angry with me, and I was angry with myself for being afraid. I was just about to push the, open the library door when my foot, or with my foot when the master said, compliments of his majesty gentlemen there's enough money here to bribe half the rebel army i stopped and i peered through the crack madame's linen chest the one she had fussed about until or when we arrived was in the middle of the library floor the top thrown open underskirts and shifts were heaped on the floor beside it stockton reached into the chest and pulled out two handfuls of paper currency Huzza! the ink stained or said ink stained as gold buttons let out a low whistle do you have a man ready lockton asked two shabby wig answered one will operate out of corby's tavern the other from highlander good lockton crossed back to his desk i could no longer see him but his words were clear every man was willing to switch sides or every man that is willing to switch sides is to be paid five uh, uh, guineas and two hundred acres of land if if he has a wife an additional hundred acres each child of his blood garners another fifty makes me want to marry the next lady i can clap my eyes on gold button said locked and chuckled i gave the door a little push open and swung er, and it swung open sir i asked in a hushed tone enter locked and said i walked in the other men did not look my way i was invisible to them until they needed something jam he said with a smile put it right there i placed the tray in front of him and i took my place again in the corner the men spread jam on their bread and drank their wine discussing politics and war and armies over the stack of money um, on my ma on my master's desk the smell of apricots filled the room it put me in mind of the or uh, orchards down the road from miss mary's place i kept my face still as a plaster mask but inside my brain pan thoughts chased round and round by the time the men rose to leave i knew what i had to do